This is Git Minutes episode 42 with another interview from the Git Merge 2017 conference back uh, from February. And the second episode from the conference that uh, we're publishing here. Um, uh, in this one, we're talking to Eric van Zeit from Atlassian about clone bundles. Git Minutes is a show for proficient Git users featuring stories, discussions, ideas, and other things useful for those using Git today. I'm your host, Thomas Ferris Nikolaisen. You can find more information about the show and how to support it on gitminutes.com. This episode was recorded on the 3rd of February, 2017. And the show notes are available on links.gitminutes.com slash 42. Git Minutes is hosted and sponsored by DigitalOcean. You can get $10 of credit by entering the promo code gitminutes10 after you register your account. In this episode, I'm talking to Eric van Zeist. He's a developer from Atlassian Bitbucket, and at Git Merge this year, he shared some interesting experiments they have been making using clone bundles, which is a technique from Mercurial that will dramatically improve performance of repository cloning. And now they've also started experimenting with uh, doing clone bundles with Git. Now I'm uh, talking to Eric van Zeist uh, yep. from uh, Atlassian. Yep. You were also at the uh, Developer Summit yesterday, and uh, yeah. you, you also uh, uh, talked about this uh, concept of uh, clone bundles. Can you t tell us a bit about that? Yeah, clone bundles, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I work, on, I work for Atlassian. I work on Bitbucket. Uh, I've worked on Bitbucket for many years now. Uh, and, uh, and Bitbucket does both Mercurial and Git. It started out with, you know, as Mercurial only, and, uh, and, and you know, we've long since added Git. And so we, we still do both. And uh, and we try to maintain feature parity between Git and Mercurial, uh, and, uh, and and scale them both up as we go. And uh, and and clone bundles is something that sort of came from uh, came from Mercurial. Um, the, the the challenge running a like a, a code hosting site um, that is large is uh, is scaling it up properly as people you know clone your repos over yeah. and over, and, uh, and and that that gets really expensive. And so, uh, like, really expensive. A lot of our resources are spent basically serving uh, people cloning. In uh, in, in Mercurial, uh, so Mozilla Mozilla uses Mercurial a lot, in, uh, and they have these really large Firefox repos, in, uh, and they get they get hammered. In uh, in and one of the the guys on uh, uh, that you know works for Mozilla is also a core contributor to uh, Mercurial. Sure. And he sort of put one and one together, and he, uh, he wrote this extension for Mercurial uh, a few years ago, clone bundles, that allows the, the server to uh, redirect a client that is cloning to an external you know, a CDN um, where uh, there's a, a pre-generated static bundle file that the client can download uh, locally uh, without overloading the server um, and, and, and then only get any sort of remaining updates from the server. And so it, it offloads almost all of the load uh, from the central server when people are cloning. Okay, so so is this um, is this like a server side extension or something that the client has to have activated as well? So it's both, um, as in it's a it's a, it's an extension on the on the server and on the client. Uh, so in Mercurial, like in Git, there is a sort of an extensible capabilities mechanism where you know clients and servers can announce the the level of sophistication that they have and uh, and, and negotiate the features that they can use. Um, very similar, and uh, so clone bundles was introduced as a, an extension on the server, where the server announces that it has clone bundle support, and uh, and the client does the same thing, and then if they both match, they can use it. Um, so it started out as an extension. Uh, it has since been merged into core, and so it's enabled by default. In Mercurial. In Mercurial. Okay. Correct. Yep. And so, um, and so this is entirely Mozilla's work, um, and, uh, and very successful. And, and we just only just recently, last month. We uh, enabled it on Bitbucket as well, and so every uh, Mercurial repository on Bitbucket uh, now has you know uh, CDN-based cloning uh, oh, support. So okay. clones generally are a lot faster. Okay, so you're already using this in the, all your Mercurial repositories. Correct. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and so that was great, and uh, because it like it it makes it faster, especially for people not in the U.S. Uh, on slower networks, um, while at the same time making it cheaper for us in terms of server-side resources. And so, like it's a win-win. It's, it's really it's yeah, really absolutely. Nice. Um, so, uh, what sort of resources are you saving by this? Uh, is it like memory or I/O or whatever? 
Yeah, it's a uh, it's all three. It's CPU, memory, and I/O. Uh, so in Mercurial, and this is very very similar to the way Git uh, works. When a, a clone request comes in, the uh, the client basically asks for a copy of the repository or, or a subset of the repository. And, uh, and, and what happens on the server at that point is that the client and the server and, uh, negotiate exactly which objects the client needs. Yeah. And then uh, and then the server builds a like a, a bespoke pack file or bundle file um, that contains just that stuff. It's compressed neatly, and that is then uh, uploaded to the client. The client then uh, sort of processes it, unpacks it, and, and there you go. And but the the act of generating that bespoke bundle file or pack file on the server is very expensive. Okay. It's, it, you know, involves compression and things. Yeah, and uh, Git and Mercurial are slightly differently implemented, but uh, the problem is the same essentially. And so we save a tremendous amount of CPU time uh, and I/O because you've got to read all these objects on the uh, on the on the server. And so uh, so yeah, it's it's. It is very expensive. So it sounds like uh, w when I get my bundle, I get a static part, which is updated daily or how often, I don't know, uh, from the CDN. And then I get like the remaining bits from, from the, the repository itself. Yep. Uh, is that correct? And that, yeah. that one's up to date. So if anybody has like pushed yep. in the meantime, uh, and the, so the CDN version, the static version is like outdated, then I get like the rema remaining work yep. uh, from, from the real repository, but that's a much cheaper operation. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's precisely how it works. And so we uh, we, we have a bunch of heuristics uh, when when we decide when to update the CDN-based bundle. Huh? Um, the, uh, the system is flexible enough that we can uh, serve like a stale old version of the, uh, of the static bundle to new clients mm -hmm. uh, because of the fact that in the same cloning operation, at the end, Mercurial will reach out to the server and, and do effectively a fetch, right? Like so, what, what in Git would be a fetch. Okay. And uh, and therefore, need you you guarantee to be entirely up to date with the server. It's just that the more the the, the, the more fresh that origin that, that static bundle is, well, the faster the whole process is. And so, like it's up to us to determine how often we sort of republish and refresh that bundle file. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Um, and now you, you mentioned this kind of content negotiation stuff, and uh, it sounds like that is a bit bigger part of the core concepts in Mercurial than I suspect that it is in Git. Uh, can you say kind of how they differ there? Does Git have the this, this same potential? Yes, I think it does. Uh, in fact, I think the two are, are very similar. Uh, in fact, in both systems, this, this sort of extensibility thing is called capabilities. And, uh, the, the protocol is, is a little different, but at the end of the day, it, it, in both systems, it comes uh, down to the fact that uh, when a client connects to a server, um, both uh, advertise the, the list of capabilities that they that they support, okay. uh, which is essentially just a, a list of you know arbitrary strings. And uh, you can see this on the protocol level if you monitor like a, a, a you know like a Git or a, or a Mercurial clone, like you can see these things just pass by. Yeah, and it's uh, and so. In Git, it works similar. Like uh, if the the client uh, connects to a server and, and runs a command, like in the first line, it it, it advertises uh, the list of strings that it supports, and the server does the same thing, echoing it back. Yeah. So after that initial handshake, uh, both know what the other supports, and uh, and so at that point, you, know, you can use the most effective way of communicating. Okay. So the, the, we already have the content negotiation part is ready for communicating a clone bundle uh, as a capability. Uh, what else do you need uh, in order to do this uh, in Git? Yeah, right. So, um, so we built a, a little spike uh, internally. Um, so we have a version of Bitbucket that has clone bundle support for Git internally, but it's it's added to Git in a way that is backwards and forwards compatible because of the capabilities. And so, what we need beyond the capabilities is, uh, uh, well, first of all, we have to decide how to work it into the existing uh, Git protocol effectively. So we in our spike uh, took a simplistic approach, which is very similar to uh, the way that it is added to Mercurial. We already knew how it works, and it's very simple. Uh, it's not really over-engineered. Um, whether or not that is the ideal way of doing it in Git, I, I don't know. This is one of the reasons, I guess, that we're, we've discussed it uh, yesterday at the, uh, with the other uh, contributors. But um, essentially, like what you need next is after you've agreed between client and server that clone bundle support exists, uh, the client then uh, asks the, the server uh, in a new command basically what the location of the uh, the bundle is mm -hmm. and uh, the server then responds with a uh, uh, one or more external typically external URLs uh, to S3 or something uh, CDN and, and the client then 
at that point, in our spike at least, disconnects. Um, it's you know it's done with the uh, with the cloning operation. It, it uh, then reaches out, to, downloads the, the static bundle file, like, you know, applies it locally. For that, by the way, we use uh, the Git bundle file format, which is, already exists, yeah. which is effectively a, a pack file with a little bit of metadata, including like the refs. Um, and, and so we're using that off the shelf. Uh, we download the bundle, we apply it locally, and then. Uh, in the same operation, we go back to the server and, uh, and we do a regular fetch. Okay, and and this works uh, using a, sort of a custom client or, or a wrapper or a script that uses Git and this extra uh, these extra capabilities. Yeah, so the our spike was uh, a little hacky in the sense that we we wrote our own uh, clone command from yeah. scratch. Yeah. Okay. Really, what it does is it makes the initial connection, uh, advertise the fact that it supports clone bundles, uh, checks whether the server understands it, uh, and then the custom logic effectively, or you know, the part that isn't in Git, uh, then downloads the bundle, applies it locally. And then after that, really, we just run a regular Git fetch. OK. How, how will you decide? Will, it, will, it, will you go for this becoming a part of Git, or will it rather be sort of an extension, I guess, like Git LFS is, uh, is today? Yep, the, the the thing with clone bundles is that the uh, like it makes cloning a lot faster and a lot cheaper, and so there's a strong incentive for us or, or you know hosting servers in general uh, for this to be widely available. Yeah, and so if we make this an extension that people can just you know install or add or configure or turn on, uh, then uh, we run the risk that most people won't know about it and won't enable it. Absolutely. And uh, and and then it really doesn't do anything, and That's so uh, like the. The discussion yesterday with the uh, the at the contributor summit, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we should try really hard to come up with something that you know fits nicely into Git, and then make sure that you know it gets into core and is enabled by default, at least on the client side, enabled by default. Mm -hmm. But you know that's we'll have to figure out uh, if it fits nicely, if if we can implement it properly. Uh, but yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I think that that should be the goal to make sure that this gets in and, and is always enabled by default in the client. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can also imagine a lot of the companies that are rep rep representing uh, at, at the summit yesterday, they also make clients or wrap clients at their end. So if we can't get it into Git core on the client side, maybe they can at least add it in their tooling. So at least, uh, you know, Git for Windows, no, uh, sorry, GitHub for Windows and uh, the bit, what's it called again? Source tree. <laughs> Source tree yep, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, would yeah. use it, of course. Yep. And uh, Visual Studio would. And everybody's who's just interested in giving their users a better experience would definitely en enable this, right? Yeah, it, for sure. So it, it's funny because we, we, we talked about it uh, internally, uh, like the potential of you know bringing this to Git and, uh, and whether or not it would be uh, achievable and, and acceptable and all that kind of stuff. And then the, internally, the, the discussion sort of turned into, well, you know, like even if it doesn't, make it into Git core because uh, all kinds of valid reasons maybe, um, we could still, at the very least, uh, build it into uh, like Atlassian's own tools, right? Like source tree is one of them. Like it's, yeah. uh, it's, uh, and they have a lot of users too, I a imagine. A ton of users, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and our, you know, we have CI servers, like, so we can build it into those CI servers yeah. at least, and, uh, which we could definitely do. But obviously, like, the main focus is to uh, try and come up with a, uh, an implementation and a, and a design that uh, like fits into core and, and can go into core. But you're right. I mean, like, uh, even if we didn't, at the very least, like, we could make sure that the the clients that we control um, would be able to take advantage of it. Again, like what we saw from Mercurial is like the uh, the performance of, of cloning, uh, especially for people further away from the US, um, it just improved dramatically. So you know, it's a win-win. It's a win for for users, and it's a win for us because it's far cheaper for us to run the service. Absolutely. Uh, so, what was the response yesterday from from, from the others? I, I... So I. I think generally it was encouraging. Uh, the, uh, the the concept of using an external uh, source to uh, to help clone a repository initially is something that is not new. The idea is not new. It's been floated on the Git mailing list before uh, in, in several uh, contexts in uh, and, and various degrees of sophistication. Um, it never really led to anything, but the uh, we I think we noticed yesterday in the uh, when it was presented that. Uh, there's a lot of people that were interested in the in the concept, the the ability to uh, you know see the repository from something else. Uh, another thing that is a uh, uh, sort of a, a concern has been brought up before is that uh, a clone cloning a large repository, whether or not it comes from a, like a remote uh, CDN or look uh, or a live server, is not resumable. 
And so when it when it fails and you get a really large repo, you got to do it again and again, and it's very painful. And so another thing that would be nice is if uh, if you could make cloning resumable or pull resumable, something yeah. like that. And uh, if you use uh, like if you build something like this where you have an external CDN and, and static resources involved, making something uh, resumable is it becomes a lot simpler, right? Because yeah. you're downloading a static file, and so you can use offsets and all that stuff. And so. Um, It'd be nice. Like, this is not what we had in mind originally, but uh, it, it'd be very nice that if you if you built this uh, with CDN support, that you would also spend that little bit of extra effort to uh, to uh, make that possible, like get the the resumability of a of a clone. Mm. Um, can you imagine if you're working with clients or with with uh, let's say I've cloned something using uh, these bundles uh, using a source tree or special special application like that to get to get the get it cloned fast and then later on when i do a, another pull using you know core git or normal git which doesn't have this capability will will that work or is the clone somehow uh, bundle specific if i started off using uh, these kind of cloning bundle, bundles right uh, so no it isn't uh, the there is absolutely no difference in the end result Uh, once you've cloned it, you have cloned it, and you end up with a you know a, a collection of pack files and loose objects and, and refs, and, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing special about it. The uh, the only extension that we've built so far, uh, at least in that spike, and that's what we're aiming for, is a uh, is is a way to uh, speed up the, uh, the the protocol downloading the stuff. And so uh, so no, you can totally clone a repo with uh, with uh, clone bundles, and then after that. Uh, interact with it with you know old uh, clients and a pool with old clients and the reverse is true also right if you already have a uh, a repo cloned um, you can you know upgrade to a to a, a different version of git that has clone bundle support and continue using it oh and and uh, yeah it, the pools will also be using uh, the, the the cdn or the the bundles it, it depends uh, the spike that we built does not so the, the spike that we built uh, copies uh, what mercurial did and uh, mercurial's solution is is fairly simple uh, in that it, it only facilitates the initial clone okay uh, it does nothing for for a fetch and uh, and so and maybe that's okay right like the, yeah, the yeah. common use case i would think is is you know you have to You start with a large clone, and after that, typically at least, uh, your your pulls and your fetches are are small. Absolutely. Um, I'm not saying that we should only ever facilitate the initial clone. I mean, if we could if we could work this into uh, into Git elegantly in a way that you know is not specific to the original clone uh, or the initial clone, uh, then we probably should. Um, yeah, yeah. But the initial clone is where most of the work happens. Absolutely, so for I sure. Guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then it's kind of easy to imagine that I. If I want faster cloning, I'll, I just get into the habit of using this custom tool instead of using git clone as I'm, I'm used to before. But like, like you said, it's hard to get big adoption yep. if, if people have to think about it and do something actively. Yep, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, uh, I would hope that it's, it, that's not necessary. You know, and, and this this rolls out and it's always available. Uh, but, but yeah, like it would definitely be a lot, a lot faster. Okay. Is there anything else you want to you share about the conference or uh, stuff you want people to, to take a look at or something like that? So this is my first Git merge. I wasn't here last year or the year before. And uh, I'm pleasantly surprised to see that it is a, it is a very, even though it's, it's organized by, uh, by, by GitHub and sort of run by GitHub, it is a, uh, it's not really, it's not branded as such. And, uh, and the speakers also are very, uh, from, they're from all kinds of different companies. And, and, yeah. and, and even, which I, uh, you can't, see this on the podcast, but the t-shirt that I'm, I'm wearing now is a Mercurial t-shirt, <laughs> um, which I deliberately wore because I was, thought it was funny to uh, wear to a Git conference. Um, however, uh, there is a talk on scaling Mercurial uh, later in the afternoon um, yeah. by, uh, uh, by Durham, uh, who works at, at, at uh, Facebook. Yeah. And so uh, I think that's pretty classy too, right? In fact, I think it sort of highlights, like going back to the clone bundles thing, where Uh, you've got Git, which is incredibly successful, and, and certainly in terms of adoption, more successful than, than any other uh, you know, DVCS out there. Um, uh, certainly more successful than Mercurial. But still, you know, there's things that we can take from other systems, like Mercurial, in, in case of the clone bundles, and, and hopefully adopt and you know and make both systems better. And so, in that regard, like uh, I, I don't know, I'm pleasantly surprised that there is a like a Mercurial talk as well. Uh, not because I'm particularly fond of Mercurial, but just you know, it's it's more than just like a single-minded focus on, on this one technology. Yeah. And so, uh, I know, I think that's, that's pretty nice. Absolutely. There's a, a lot we can learn from the competition, so to say. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for talking with me, Eric. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Awesome.
And that's it for this episode. While you wait for the next one, you can subscribe to Git Rev News. Just go to links.gitminutes.com slash news, and you'll be led to the site where you can subscribe to this monthly newsletter covering the latest of Git development and related Git stuff. Once again, you can find the show notes for this episode on links.gitminutes.com slash 42. And there you can also support, support the show via Flatter or Gratty Pay. Big thanks to everyone supporting the show, including our sponsor, DigitalOcean. Sign up using the promo code GITMINUTES10 for $10 of credit, and you'll be supporting the show. You can post feedback or comments directly under the show notes, or send me an email on feedback at gitminutes.com. You can follow the show on Twitter or Google+, Plus, where you'll be notified of any new episodes, or head over to gitminutes.com to see all the fanciful ways you can subscribe. Until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>